Well, good morning. So glad that you guys can join us uh, on this beautiful Sunday morning. A uh, couple of things I want to tell you about. First is, remember, there's always a Sunday school lesson. And uh, another great one, this time by Jamie Bone. You'll find it either on the app or the website. Make sure you grab that and enjoy her great teaching. You uh, heard me last week invite you to be part of a member support fund that we're going, a special offering that we're going to uh, raise here to help people in our church who have been impacted economically by the coronavirus. You should be getting a letter from me about that, but if you're able, please help us do that so that we can help our people and uh, maybe some others as well. Uh, many of you are probably wondering, when are we going to reopen now that Kemp has said the state is open for business and certain uh, businesses? Well, we are working on that. Uh, you may have already seen the statement that I issued about the task force that we've already put together that is exploring the uh, possibility of opening. Now, here's what I want to ask you to do right now. Just please be patient because we don't want to open until it is safe for us to do so. Your health and welfare is the most important thing when it comes to reopening the church. So be patient with us. We're thinking at the earliest, it may be mid-June. But there's a chance we could do it sooner. That's our prayer. So keep praying that that might happen as well. You have been very kind in helping us prepare notes to go with the meals that we are providing to workers at our hospitals here in the Valdosta area. Uh, this past Thursday, we fed 100 workers uh, at South Georgia Medical Center, and we gave them, because you wrote notes, we gave them a note with every single meal, a word of encouragement. We need that again for the meal we're serving tomorrow. Would you please uh, write a note and bring it by the church so that we can put those with the meals? We need a hundred of them. You are great to do 104 for last Thursday. Please help us with that if you would. Would you also remember to fill out your communication card so we can know you're here and how we can pray for you? Let me pray for us as we get started. Father, thank you for the chance to be together. Even though we're separated, your spirit binds us together. And so thank you that we can worship you today uh, here at Park Avenue. May you be glorified by all we do as we love you in this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's get started in worship this morning. I want you to sing where you are, lifting your voices to our Creator, letting Him know that we know what He has done for us. Here we go, let's sing it out this morning. Who am I that the highest would welcome? I was lost, but He brought me Oh, His love for me. Oh, His love
I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. For every child of God defeats this evil world. And we achieve this victory through our faith. And who can win this battle against the world but only those that believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Come on, sing with me. I am chosen. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Come on, lift your voices this morning. I'm chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. Oh, you are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Do you believe it? I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. Oh, you are for me, not against me. I am. this music we're doing this morning as we're talking about flip the script for the next many weeks um, mainly because when when Christ flips our script when Jesus touches us as we talked about last week we're changed we are different and we recognize that we need to be different because we see sin in the world we see the problem we recognize that we've got something that needs fixing that needs changing and so Christ comes in and does what he does best and cleanses and changes us for his glory, for his purpose. And so we, we in turn worship him and give him praise and honor and glory for all that he has done. But as the song talks about, when we overcome, we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Because we are changed, we then have the right, the obligation, the joy to talk about who we were and who we are now because of Christ. It's the way Christ designed it. Acts 1-8, to go and make disciples. We go and make disciples by teaching them what Christ taught us, but our, our door to get into people is to tell them what he did for us. That these things are true that the Bible has written about because it has happened in our very life. And so as we just continue worshiping this morning through the song, I pray that you can recognize where you were before Christ and where you are now. And then you can just lift your voice and, and just glorify him and praise his name for who he is and what he has done in your life. And know that you have your testimony this morning. You have the testimony of what Christ has done in your life to share with those around you. to die poured out for all mankind God's only son perfect and spotless one 
that he never sinned, but suffered as if he did. And all authority, every victory is yours. Christ has overcome. And that's what we're here. We don't serve a God that we're waiting for him to win. He's already won. So let's pray as we continue to worship. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful or that we don't have to live in fear of the things in this world because we have a Savior 
who has already overcome this world. There is nothing here that can defeat you. And because we are your children, ultimately, eternally, Lord, there is nothing in this world that can defeat us. And Lord, we come this morning and we thank you and we praise you for that. Lord, we ask that you would be with us where we are in our homes as we're scattered out. Lord, that you would bring us peace this morning. That you would bring us an absolute certainty that you are fighting for us. God, I pray for medical workers. I pray for nurses and doctors and researchers. And I have been praying for them. But this week, you have brought something to my mind. Jamie, don't put all your hope in them. Put your hope in me. Because I am the one who will deliver my children. I am the one who's going to flip this script of COVID-19. I will use people who are wise. I will use people. But I will do this. And I have praised God this week for the reminder that no matter what we go through, no matter what we're carrying, God's already got it. He's already done it. So we don't have to live in fear to all of these things. And at this point, um, God, I am just so thankful that we don't. I am so thankful that we don't. I pray, Lord, that you would convict us deep in our hearts convict us those of us who are living with that peace right now God I pray that you would convict us to reach out to those people who are in this world right now who do not know that peace they do not know how, how we can have this calmness in the midst of absolute chaos how we can praise a savior in the midst of such a storm. But we can do that because we know the one who controls the storm. And so God, we just ask that you would push us, push us out of our comfort zones. Let us not get complacent in this sheltering at home or even venturing back out. Lord, please, Jesus, let us be wise if we venture out. Not necessarily for our own sake, but for the sake of others. Or this is the time when you have called us to love each other like we never have. And I thank you and I praise you for that. God, I ask that you would hear us as we join our voices together this morning in praying the prayer that Jesus Christ taught his disciples to pray. And he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank y'all so much for continuing to give, for continuing to give your tithes to Uh, give your time, give your heart, give your love. I can't tell you how overwhelming it's been for me. I've gotten texts, I've gotten calls, I've gotten letters uh, just from people who want to pour out um, to others. So thank y'all so much. Because of you again, God is doing a work in the world right now. So thank you. So let me, let me start with a question this morning. Let's just suppose that this happened to you. What if you walked out to your mailbox uh, at the end of your driveway early in the morning before, before dawn to get your newspaper? Uh, and, or, or maybe it's just to go on your early morning walk before the sun comes up. And, and as you got to the end of your driveway, Jesus was standing there. I mean, how would you feel if that happened? Or, or, or maybe, maybe it's this, this scenario. What if, what if you walked out uh, into your backyard one, late one evening, maybe just to get a breather, kind of to get away from things, and you just walked out there because you didn't want anybody to see you, so you're in the backyard, and when you walked out there, Jesus was there. What would you do? What would you do? 
Well, that sort of happened to a woman in Samaria uh, in the Gospel of John that Jesus meets at a very famous well. And that's our scripture today as we uh, look at how Jesus flips our script when we encounter him. And so I want to read that passage for you. It comes from John chapter 4. It's, it's, a, it's a long passage, but I've, I'm just going to read portions of it. So it starts at verse 1 and we'll finish at verse 42. So read along with me. It'll be on the screen. Jesus came to the Samaritan village of Sychar near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. This is that very famous well that I was talking about. In fact, uh, archaeologists know, uh, found that well, and we know where it is today. A uh, cathedral was built over it, as a lot of the holy sites uh, uh, experienced. But we know where it was, and, and the archaeologists have discovered that it was a very deep well. It's known as Jacob's Well. So he came there, uh, and he was tired, it says. Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. I call it high noon. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised. I'll tell you why in a minute. For Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and animals enjoyed? Jesus replied, Anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband. For you have had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You, sp you certainly spoke the truth. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he'll he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be, could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, he told me everything I ever did. Then they said to the woman, now we believe, not just because you told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the savior of the world. So this Samaritan woman goes to the well at noon to draw water and she meets this man here, but she doesn't know when she gets there who this person is. It kind of reminded me of a TV show. I think it may still be on. It's called Undercover Boss. You remember that show? I, Debbie and I used to enjoy watching that show because the CEO or president of some particular company or a big business would go undercover. They would disguise them with a wig and mustache or change their hair if it's a woman. And they would go to their uh, place of employment and they would work as an employee alongside others who worked there. It was, a, it was an interesting uh, TV show and we enjoyed it. But then at the very end of the show, you remember what would happen? There would be a big reveal, which... Uh, would surprise a lot of those employ employees because they didn't expect that this was the CEO they'd been working with. And let me tell you, for some of them, it worked out great and the CEO rewarded them. But for, for others, 
boy, they, they lost their job. Well, this woman didn't know who Jesus was, but it was the Messiah that she was engaged with here at this well by herself. And little did she know that he was about to flip her script. You know, there would be no miracle healing with this encounter. There was no water to wine. There was no raising of a Lazarus type experience. I mean, it was just a conversation between Jesus and this woman that would change everything for her. You know, I, I don't think this was just a lucky break that they just happened to get there at the same time. I, I don't think it was a chance encounter. In fact, I believe, and I think the scripture supports it, this was an absolute intentional act on the part of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Uh, we know that because of what John said in verse 4. It's right before the uh, passage that I read to you today. Look what it says, starting in verse 3. It says, Jesus left Judea, he and disciples, and returned to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria on the way. Fill in that blank. But no, he didn't. He didn't have to go through Samaria. In fact, uh, what good Jew would ever do that? Because as we know, there was tension and even hatred between Jews and Samaritans. And here's what we also know. It wasn't just that the Jews didn't care for the Samaritans. The Samaritans didn't like the Jews either. And so there was this hatred relationship between them. In fact, for Jews, they would say that Samaritans were the ultimate basket of deplorables. I even remember one scholar talking about how a Jew would relate to a Samaritan who owed the Jew money. Maybe they bought something from him or owed him some money. You know what they would actually require? The Jew would require that the Samaritan wash the money before they handed it to the Jew to get rid of the Samaritan that would have been on the money. Well, how do I know that this was on purpose? Uh, let me explain to you. I've got a map that shows uh, the areas that we're talking about. And the first map will just show us that Judea is there towards the bottom of the map. And then in the middle part, you'll see Samaria, a uh, little kind of bluish color. And then above that, going north, you'll see Galilee. Well, uh, Jerusalem is there in Judea. You see where I've circled it in red. And this is the way that most people would go to Galilee. Look at the yellow line. They would go around Samaria because no good Jew would step on Samaritan soil. And that's the way they would go to avoid going through there. But not Jesus. Jesus went straight north, right into the heart of Samaria. And there's a reason that he did that. I, I believe it was especially to meet this Samaritan woman, but it was also to show the disciples something that they needed to learn about other people. So Jesus intentionally chose to go to Sychar in Samaria, knowing that this well was there and knowing that around noontime, there was one particular Samaritan woman who had come to draw water. She wasn't looking for him, but he was looking for her. So why did he do that? I mean, why? Well, it's because that's what God does. In the eyes of God, there are no deplorables. There are only wayward sons and daughters who, for one reason or another, have moved away from Christ instead of, instead of towards Christ. And so that's what God does. And when this Samaritan woman came here, he was looking for her because he's always looking for us. In fact, whatever you're going through right now, wherever you are in the midst of this coronavirus time, let me, let me just remind you, Jesus is looking for you. And so the woman says to him, or he says to the woman, he says to her, give me a drink. Isn't that interesting? Could you, could you give me a drink of water? And it startled her because she knew that this was a Jew who was now speaking to a Samaritan woman and nobody would do that. And so you got to wonder, what was she thinking when this encounter happened? Well, I think the thoughts that she was having then are a lot of the same thoughts that we have in life, things that we wrestle with. And here's the first one. We, we wrestle with the idea of what others think about us. And maybe you've done that too. You know, somewhere along the way, we're not exactly sure where, this woman's journey 
took a turn for the worse. Maybe it wasn't all her fault, or maybe it was. But here's what we know, as Jesus pointed out, and she confirmed, she had had five husbands who for one reason or another walked out on her or divorced her. And the man that she was with at the time she met with Jesus wouldn't even put a ring on her finger. And Jesus pointed out that embarrassment as well. She knew where she stood with Jews, but she had also come to know where she stood with her fellow Samaritans because she's coming to the well by herself at noon for a reason. She's hated by them and ostracized by her own people because of her sin. You know, survival with some sense of decency for her meant coming alone to draw water from this well where no one would make fun of her or roll their eyes or snicker behind her back or maybe even shout obscenities to her. She was there alone, except that Jesus also was there. You know, she had all kinds of strikes against her. Her sin was many, and it was stacking up all around her. And, and because it was stacking up, maybe so high that it, that it separated her from those around her, and some of them even in her own city. But this was life for her now. And she was resolved that this was just the way it was going to be for the rest of her life. You know, what others think about us impacts and often shapes how we live. In fact, uh, we compromise our, our faith. We make unwise choices. We do things that we really shouldn't have ever done because we think for some reason that's going to make others think better of us. And our value, we think, comes from that. Our value is what other people think of us, and it defines who we are. Well, there's some truth to uh, what we know, and that's this, that character and integrity really do matter. They really do. So how we live, the things we choose to do, it really makes a difference. In fact, the Bible talks about that in a number of places. In Proverbs 20, verse 11, it says this, All children show what they're really like by how they act. You can dis discern their character, whether they are pure or perverse. It's true. It's interesting that it's talking about children. But you know what? It's true of adults as well. We can determine by their action whether they are pure or perverse. And look what it says in Psalm 119 about integrity. You know, it's a, it's a psalm about life and how you can live a life that is a happy life. It's, it's a psalm about happiness. And here's what it says. It says, you're only truly happy when you walk in total integrity, walking in the light of God's word, character and integrity matter. And this woman had lost perhaps both of them. And she knew the truth. When others think of me, she thought, they move away. And it's true. That's why she came out here all alone at noon. And you know what? Sometimes you just get used to doing that. We wrestle with what others think about us, but we also wrestle with what we think about ourselves sometimes. You know, this woman had to be thinking, I made some bad choices, and I, I know I blew it. I shouldn't have done that, but I did. And now I'm in this hole that I dug for myself, and I don't know how to get out of it. In fact, I'm not even sure there is a way out of it. It reminds me of a few years ago when I was uh, uh, with some friends uh, from work at a, at a church, and they said, hey, let's go to this trampoline park in Macon. It was called Sky Zone. And so we were, uh, I was a little ap apprehensive about this, but I'm, you know, I, I said, let's try it. So I went with them. I'm probably the oldest in the crowd. And so there's one particular area. If you've been to one of these things, you know, they got a lot of trampolines around. They had this one area, they called it, I think it was called the Foam Zone. And they had these trampolines uh, in the floor. And just beyond the trampolines was this giant pit. And it had these foam boxes in it. I mean, there must have been a thousand or more of them, this giant area. And, and so what you do is you run and you bounce off of the trampoline and you can 
fly out into the, the foam boxes and land safely. And it's a lot of fun. People are doing flips. Some of them were doing, you know, like uh, high dives and different things. And, and so I said, all right, I'll do that. So it was my turn. And I step up and run and jump. And I go out about halfway out in the pit and land softly. And all of a sudden I realize that I'm starting to sink in these foam uh, boxes. And I try to pull myself up and I couldn't do it. I mean, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm probably going to die in here. I was struggling, trying to do it. Everybody else was bouncing back out, but I was in this pit. And then you start thinking all kinds of crazy things. You remember hearing those crazy rumors that there were snakes in the, in the ball pits at the restaurants where they had children's play area. You're like, I'm like, are there snakes in here? What's going to happen? Am I going to live my life? Is this, I'm going to die here? You know, I don't know, maybe about 20 or 30 minutes later, I finally crawled myself. I was exhausted, crawled myself out of there. And I said, I will not do that again in my life. A pit that she dug that she didn't think she could ever get out of. You know, um, she had this whole sense that she was helpless and that she deserved what she was getting. David in Psalm 25 felt that, obviously, because you need to hear what he said and the cry of his heart. Look at it. It's in Psalm 25, starting in verse 15, filling these blanks. It says, Rescue me, Lord, for you're my only hero. Sorrows fill my heart as I feel helpless, mistreated. I'm all alone and in misery. Come closer to me now, Lord, for I need your mercy. Turn to me, for my problems seem to be going from bad to worse. You ever, you ever feel that way? It's like, I just can't get a break. I mean, and everything I touch turns bad. Maybe there's some folks that feel that right now. Look what he says next, though. Only you, fill in that blank, can free me from all these troubles until you lift this burden, the burden of all my sins, my troubles and trials, will be more than I can handle. Can't you feel my pain? Wow. I, mean, I can feel it just by reading that. Maybe you can too. But this woman at the well, she must have given up. She probably felt like there was no rescue coming for her. But yet, we, we see in the story, as I read it a minute ago, you see in her some questioning, some statements that, that suggest that there's this longing inside of her for something greater, something bigger. Maybe she doesn't understand it because she's a little confused. In fact, the Samaritan understanding of the Messiah was different from the Jewish understanding and our understanding of it. And, and notice what she says in verse 25. She said, I know Messiah is coming and he will explain everything to us. So they saw the Messiah as a good teacher who would explain why she was going through what she was going through. They didn't see him as a savior. But Jesus makes it clear to her. He responds to her and he says, I am the Messiah. I'm the one you've been looking for. And listen, I'm the only one that can rescue you and save you. He could feel her pain. In fact, he could see her pain. That's why he was there in the first place. So we wrestle with what others think of us. We wrestle with what we think of ourselves. And then here's, here's one that, that happens naturally, especially when we're introduced to Jesus. We wrestle with what Jesus thinks of us. What does he think of me? You know, the answer to that question, what we think of Jesus, depends on what what he thinks of us depends on what we think of him and who he is. Because here's, here's his reply. Look at verse 10. Here's what he said. He replied, he says, If you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are and who you are speaking to, you will ask me and I would give you living water. Now let me tell you about living water and what he's talking about there because it's kind of confusing. What does he really mean? Water in the... Um, Holy Land was very precious, as we know. But when they would talk about water, uh, they're talking about moving water. You, you lead me beside quiet streams, 
right? You lead me to green pastures. And, and so they're talking about moving water. And here's the thing about moving water. Moving water purifies, it cleanses, it refreshes, it restores on its own. And so what Jesus is saying, I'm offering that to you. I'm offering purity and cleanliness and refreshing and even being restored. <laughs> that value that you're looking for, that character and integrity that you've lost. Moving water, living water. And here's what I love about this conversation that changed this woman's life. Jesus doesn't condemn her. He, he doesn't say, yes, you did all these things and, and you're a sinner and, and this is what you deserve. You deserve death. And there's none of that. Instead, there's just a simple conversation where he gently lets her know that he knows her and he knows what she's gone through. And, and she says, here's someone that knows everything about me. He knows the secrets of my heart and he loves me anyway. And when she understands that and who it is that's sitting with her at the well, it changes everything. I mean, that's what Jesus does when we encounter him. As he comes looking for us and we see him and sit down with him and talk with him. I, I like what... Julian of Norwich wrote about this idea many, many years ago. Listen to what she said. She said this, Our soul shall never rest till it comes to him. She's talking about Jesus. Knowing that he is fullness of joy, friendly and courteous, blissful and very life. Our Lord Jesus said again and again, It is I, it is I who am highest. It is I whom you love. It is I whom you delight in. It is I whom you serve. It is I whom you long for, whom you desire. It is I whom you mean. It is I who am all. Isn't it true? Maybe you've already discovered that. But if not, maybe you should. But look what she did. The Bible tells us that she dropped everything she had. She dropped her jar for the water. And she ran to town when she understood who she had been encountering there at the well. And she began to tell everybody else. And listen, for the first time, maybe in years and years and years, they actually believed her and gave her credit. Something she hadn't had in a long time. And instantly it changed her. This was her identity now. From that sinful, shameful woman that we don't want to have anything to do with to this. To that woman who introduced us to the Savior. I mean, you, you talk about flipping a script. That's what happened right here at this well. Well, sinner, shame-filled, ostracized, separated from others because of the sin in our life. You know what? That happens even now. But here's the good news. Just as Jesus healed and saved this woman there at the well, he can do that even now. That's good news. I, I remember hearing a story of a college student who was starting out. I mean, she was faithfully serving Christ, and she had some bad circumstances that were not her fault. And, and when those happened in her life, her world came crushing down, crashing down, and she lost everything. You would think that she should have continued to seek the Lord through that, but this devastation did what it can do to a lot of people. It, it threw her into a tailspin, and so she began living this, this sinful life. She wasn't very proud of it all. And she wanted to return to the Lord. There was still that yearning to meet him at a well somewhere, but she just felt so unworthy, so unclean, just like the Samaritan woman. Well, one day, about a year after she had been separated from the Lord, she decided that she would go to him in prayer. And so as she prayed, here's what she did. She tried to visualize being in the presence of Jesus on a beach. Kind of reminds me of Peter being on the beach with Jesus after the resurrection where he was restored to his relationship with Christ. And she had this image of just meeting Jesus on the beach. 
And so she wanted to ask him to forgive her. And I want you to listen to how she describes her prayer with Jesus Christ. Watch this video. As I was sitting there on the beach in my mind's eye, I didn't want him to come any closer. It was just more comfortable with him far away. And I think it was fear that was causing me not to want him to come any closer. Because I just, I couldn't ask him to forgive me. I kept thinking about everything that I'd done and just the fear that I wouldn't be able to change. Um, I think the turning point for me was when I began to visualize my sin. I could see everything that I had done all around me and it was it was surrounding me and putting up this shield distancing me from him and he kept walking towards me and I kept stepping away and I kept saying this is who I am all of these things all around me that's me I, I want your forgiveness but only if you want to forgive me because this is who I am. And I just kept thinking, if I'm too far gone, then I understand. Um, and he didn't say anything. I just stood there with my arms at my side. And then Jesus started pushing away the things surrounding me. One by one, he pushed each thing until he is standing right in front of me. And finally I said, I'm so sorry. And he put his hands on my shoulder and he said, I love you. And I didn't feel any longer that I was this person surrounded by all my sin. I just, I felt like it was just me, a girl standing there who's broken by all the things that have happened in my life. And with that, for the first time in a long time, I felt like I was really forgiven. I felt like I was sitting there with a clean slate. So can you imagine what that felt like after she had that encounter with Christ? Can you imagine what the Samaritan woman felt like? A clean slate, a fresh beginning? Well, Jesus flipped this college student's script and the Samaritan's script. And he wants to do the same thing for you and for me. You know, I, I wonder about you. Or, or what are you wrestling with right now? Are, are, you, are you wrestling with what others think of you? Maybe it's the people that you are in uh, sheltering in place with. Maybe it's the people in your home. Or maybe it's the people that you work with. Or, or maybe it's people in your neighborhood. Whoever it may be. Are you wrestling with what they think of you? Are you wrestling with what you think of yourself because of mistakes you've made, because of things you've done, because of failures in your life? Are you wrestling, and I pray you are at some point in your life, with what Jesus thinks of you? Because when you wrestle with that, you're going to discover that Jesus isn't mad with you, that Jesus doesn't hate you, or he, he doesn't see you as someone unlovable. Instead, he loves you even more. And he's searching for you. He's looking for you. You know, um, maybe, maybe like the college student, you see the sin around you just stacking up and, and it, seems, it just seems to just keep getting higher and higher. And so there's another one and another one until eventually you can't see over the stack and, and you are separated from Jesus and you are separated from those around you at home or in work or wherever it may be. Maybe that's you. But listen, if that's you, here's what you ought to do today. Do what the college student did. Just pray. Visualize you and Jesus at the end of your driveway, in your backyard, wherever it may be on the beach, and you're just talking with him. And he forgives you. He doesn't step away from you. He steps towards you. And he, one by one, moves those boxes of sin that have been separating you from him. Go to him in prayer. I'll give you a chance to do that in just a few minutes. And he'll give you living water. 
that refreshes and restores and cleanses and purifies. Here's some next steps for you. You know, our, our purpose in existing here at uh, Park Avenue is to help people move closer to Christ. We believe that everybody, every person hearing my voice today, including this one speaking, can move closer to Christ. And maybe this week you'll say, I'm going to take just one step closer. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend time talking to him. I'm going to pray. I'm going to read my Bible. You know, maybe I'm going to have a conversation with someone else that will help me draw closer to him. Here's the second one. I will pray to Jesus to push away the sin like the college student did in my life. Push away the sin that keeps me from him and others. Or look at the next one. This is an important one. I will no longer believe that I am too far gone for Jesus to offer me his living water. And the last one, I will tell others about Jesus who knows everything about me. Because once he flips your script, you got to tell somebody. Let's pray if we could. Father, thank you for the Samaritan woman and for your intentional journey to sit down with her at a well. Thank you that that story teaches us even today that no matter what we have done, no matter how tall the stack of sins we have committed has gotten, it's not too tall for you. And that if we'll turn to you and receive your invitation to give us living water, you'll give it to us and you'll refresh us and restore us and cleanse us and purify us. And then when you do, and it flips our script, we need to tell others. So help us to do that, Lord. Thank you for loving us and for always looking for us. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When, um, <clears throat> when confronted with Jesus, when encountering him, whether we realize it or not, before that moment, we know that in that moment we need him. We need what he has. We need our script flipped. We need this cleansing. So this morning I just want to give you a moment to sing and reflect and let the words of this song be your prayer, uh, I guess, as you approach him this morning.
All right, you know how I like to say, turn to your neighbor and say something. So turn to your neighbor, wherever you are this morning, and say, Jesus got me out of the pit. How about that? He did get you out of the pit, and he will get you out of the pit. So listen, we love you guys. So glad you were with us today. Keep the faith. Stay safe. God's got this. We love you. See you next time.